Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I know a lot of people here, but for the new faces, I'm Michelle Wooker. I'm president of the World Policy Institute. We are a global center for thought leadership focused on emerging challenges, emerging thinkers, and emerging solutions, which hopefully exactly that order. Uh, we publish World Policy Journal, and we like to bring people together in open settings. Uh, we believe the policy is, is not just for wonks, and the, the political salon series is, we think, really the, the heart of that philosophy. Uh, the series was, was started almost 10 years ago by a close friend of the Institute, Steve Sokol, uh, who is now in Pittsburgh at the World Affairs Council, uh, bringing together a diverse group of people across political affiliations, across careers, across nationalities, to come together around the table and talk about global issues in, in a way that's really relevant to everyone. So we're delighted to continue that series. Uh, and we are especially delighted uh, to have with us tonight um, Adam Labor, um, who is not only a journalist uh, for, the, for The Economist and uh, The Times of London, Monocle, and other places, but he is also an accomplished novelist. And um, I'm guessing it's probably not coincidence that one of his novels is called Hitler's Secret Bankers, uh, which has a little bit to do uh, with the book that we are uh, here to talk about today, um, Tower of Basel, which is just a fantastic title. I love that. Um, so he's, uh, he's really delved into this, this bank, which is something that, uh, that a lot of people haven't heard of, uh, but that plays a pivotal, pivotal role in what's happening in the global economy and will continue to going forward. So he's going to talk a little bit about the, the history of the, the bank, uh, the more recent history, and he's got some very interesting uh, suggestions going forward for how the bank could be more transparent and accountable and hopefully lead to, uh, to better government. Um, the format of these talks is, uh, is informal. Uh, Adam will speak a little bit at the beginning, and then I will I'll kick off with a couple of questions, and then we open it up to the room. That the, really, what makes this event great is all of you. So, uh, be ready to uh, to tee up uh, your question. Uh, we're delighted that uh, C-SPAN Book TV is here with us tonight. Uh, so, if you could do us a favor, if you do have a, a question, just wait for the for the mic to come around so that um, so that we can hear you. But. Um, with that said, um, Adam, welcome. We are very, very happy to have you here. And I'm particularly looking forward to what you have to say, because I'm, I'm a big uh, finance geek. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to say uh, thanks to Michelle and to the World Policy Institute for having me here and for all of you coming tonight, and also for C-SPAN coming along to film us. Much, much appreciated. So we, I'm going to start a bit by just talking in general, taking you through a bit of the history of the Bank for International Settlements, and then you can kind of understand where it came from, why it's set up, and what it does today. So what is the Bank for International Settlements? Well, I always say it's the most important bank in the world that you've probably never heard of. Most people have never heard of the BIS, apart from people who are dealing with uh, you know, the more technical side of central banking or international finance. So the BIS was set up in 1930, and it was set up as part of the Young Plan. Its uh, history reaches back to the end of the First World War. And after the Germans lost, they were punished by being forced to pay reparations. And there was a lot of arguments about these reparations. How much would they pay? How long would they go on for? And um, what happened was uh, the Allied powers agreed that through the Young Plan, the BIS would be set up to collect and minister, uh, administer and manage these reparations payments. So it was set up for a really kind of obscure basis. You know, it, it, this was not a big uh, geopolitical question at the time of German reparations for the thir First World War. But the real reason it was set up was so that central bankers, i.e. the governors of national banks like the Bank of France, the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve and so on, could have a place to meet that was supremely protected and legally inviolable. What does that mean? That means that the BIS is an international organization, but it's also a commercial bank. It's a, a unique hybrid in the world. It's the world's oldest global financial institution. It was set up before the IMF and before the World Bank. But it's 
got uh, as a commercial bank it's got a like a mission and a duty to make a profit but it's got all of the same protections or uh, almost all as the United Nations or the International Monetary Fund so from the moment it was set up uh, by an international treaty the BIS's premises is almost extraterritorial the Swiss authorities have no jurisdiction over it same as you know the American Embassy or the British Embassy anywhere does uh, has that level of protection and during the 1930s the BIS became a place where the central bankers could meet and discuss things away from politicians and away from the eyes of reporters and in fact during the 30s the bank was so secretive that there was a New York Times reporter who went out to Basel to do a big piece on the BIS a big takeout for the magazine as it was then and he, and he got into the building and he said after the director's meeting, he wasn't even allowed into the room when they'd all gone because the space was so protected and so sacred. So I think that's very interesting because what it tells us is if you've ever wondered how we got to this place where all these people from the IMF and the ECB and the World Bank and whatever are flying around the world, if you look at Greece, for example, I mean, how did, how did we get here that these kind of unelected technocrats are telling everyone and telling elected governments what to do. I th my argument is that all this started at the BIS, which was the first place, you know, the birthplace of the global financial technocrat. And in the 1930s, it did some uh, good things. It organized some of the first bailouts for Spain and Hungary and Austria. But again, what was interesting was that these bailouts were being organized by the BIS and the central bankers who were meeting there. there were, I don't quite know how governments could do that, but there was no kind of political input. It was the bankers deciding where's the money going, how much they're going to get it. And, it's, and so you see the continuity of that uh, nowadays. And the BIS, the two people who really worked to set up the BIS were a guy called, a man called Montague Norman, who was the governor of the Bank of England, 1920 to 1944, and Jarmar Schacht, who was the president of the Reichsbank. And they were very close friends. And they were really the, power, the two most powerful central bankers in the world at the time. I mean, Montague Norman could come to New York, make a speech, oh, all doom and gloom, the market would go down. Come to New York, make a speech, uh, everything's going well, the market would go up. They, these were the market movers. And then it takes a rather more sinister turn, because during the 1930s, Jan Marschacht uh, also continued serving as president of the Rice Bank under Hitler. And it is generally agreed to have been absolutely crucial for the German economic revival of the 1930s that helped keep the Nazis in power, helped keep them in business. He was much more then, he also became Minister for Economics, so he was much more powerful than, say, a central banker is nowadays who's just controlling monetary policy. He was really the guy running the Nazi economy, which is why after the war he was put on trial for war crimes. And so the, the BIS uh, had a stronger and stronger German presence. Uh, other bankers, German bankers that joined the BIS were Schacht's successor, a guy, uh, Walter Funk, who was the president of the Rice Bank. His vice president, Emil Poole, was also a director of the BIS. A private banker called Kurt von Schroeder, in whose house one of the crucial meetings took place that helped bring Hitler to power. And a man called Hermann Schmitz, who was the chief executive officer of IG Farben, which was the main Nazi industrial and chemical conglomerate. And IG Farben uh, ran its own concentration camp at Auschwitz where, and also manufactured Zyklon B, the gas that was used to kill several million Jews. So during the war, the BIS became a very important part of the Nazi economy and, the, and it was kind of its bridge to the world in many ways. It was so important for the Germans that Emil Poole, the vice president of the Rice Bank, who was also a BIS director, said the BIS is the only real foreign branch of the Rice Bank. So who's running the BIS during the war? And this is where the story gets really interesting because the president of the bank from 1940 to 1946 was a man called Thomas McKittrick. Thomas McKittrick was an American, an American banker, used to live in London. He was essentially, as far as I could see, he was chosen by Montague Norman to take over at the bank. And he arrived in 1940, and the manager of the bank was a Frenchman called Roger Aubois, 
and the deputy manager of the bank was a German called Paul Hechler, a member of the Nazi party, who signed his correspondence Heil Hitler. The general secretary was an Italian, and the economic advisor was a Swede. So during the war, perhaps not surprisingly, when you consider the bank is legally inviolable, it's in neutral Switzerland, and is not really accountable to anybody, the BIS became the main venue for the covert channels between the Allies and the Nazis about post-war planning. And, um, for example, 1942, Per Jacobson, who's the bank's economic advisor, went off to America to have a lot of high-level meetings because, obviously, they're thinking, once the war's over, we've got to set up some you know, new financial system afterwards. And he comes back, and what does he do? He goes off to Berlin to tell Emil Poole everything that he's learned. So we must think that it was predictable that the people in the States who were telling him these things would know that he was probably going to do that. They know who they're talking to, that he's neutral. As a Swede, he can go backwards and forwards. And he has these connections to the Germans. And I, it's known that uh, Thomas McKittrick was an agent or an asset of Alan Dulles, because uh, at this time, Alan Dulles, the American wartime intelligence chief in Europe, was based in Bern. And he was very close friends with McKittrick. Uh, they knew each other before the war, and McKittrick would share information with him. Roger Aubois was the general manager of the bank. He was also an asset of Alan Dulles's. And I found some really amazing documents in the OSS archives where Mc, uh, Thomas McKittrick is saying that he's speaking to German industrialists and saying, look, uh, you know, the, in 1944 the war is over, and obviously, you know, you know, we're we're coming in. So if you if you if you cooperate and if you're helpful, we'll guarantee your profits. You know, at this time there was a lot of talk of decartelizing German industry, breaking up the giant steel and chemical firms. But he's saying behind the scenes, don't worry, guys, you're okay with us as long as you know you don't make life too difficult for us. So what does this mean? This means that while American and British soldiers are landing on the beaches in Normandy and walking into a hail of machine gun fire, then, and being mowed down in their thousands, Thomas McKittrick is sitting happily in Basel doing deals with German industrialists and with the Reichsbank, with, but not as some kind of, you know, individual idea, you know, he, he has this idea that he's going to go off and do this, with the knowledge of the State Department and the Office for Strategic Services. Which is why, at the time, his main, en his main enemy, really, he was his enemy at the time, was ha um, Henry Morgenthau, the Treasury Secretary, and his deputy, Harry Dexter White, really hated the BIS. And they said that uh, Henry Morgenthau said the BIS is a symbol of Nazi, Nazi instrumentality. And Harry Dexter White said, uh, you know, our boys are fighting the Germans while McKittrick's doing business with them, which is absolutely true. So by the, towards the end of the war, the BIS also accepted a substantial amount of looted Nazi gold and did a lot of foreign exchange deals for the Rice Bank. So it was a thoroughly compromised institution, but again compromised with the full knowledge of the State Department, the Bank of England, the Treasury and everybody else. So at Bretton Woods, there was a lot of pressure to shut the bank down. You know, that they're saying we're going to build a new global economic system to run the global economy after the war. We don't want this tainted institution anymore. But um, they, what ended up happening was that a resolution was passed saying that banks should be shut down at the earliest possible moment. But when is that? No date was set. So the bank survived. And one of the things the BIS is brilliant at doing, and has been since it's been born in 1930, is reinventing itself. So after the war, there was a sense, and, and there's an argument for this, look, we've got to get the global economy up and running, we've got to get, start making things, selling things, countries got to start trading, we need somewhere that can be the focal point of this. So, you know, the IMF has been set up, but nobody really knows what it is, it's, you know, it's only a year old or whatever, and the World Bank as well, whereas the BIS is there, it's got a lot of experience, it's, you know, it's got Per Jacobson, who's got contacts on all over the world, so the BIS survived, and its next phase, over the next few decades, basically, until the 1990s, uh, the BIS hosted all the preparatory work, or uh, the technical and secretarial work for the preparation of the euro. And that's how it kind of reinvented itself. 
And this started in the late 1940s with a lot of very obscure things that most people have never heard of, like the European Payments Union and the European Monetary Corporation Fund and the Committee of Governors of European Central Banks. They all met at the BIS, and place is very important here because by, although these things weren't actually part of the BIS, they were based there, they were managed there, and the BIS did their banking. So Basel became the kind of the locus, the focal point for all the post, you know, for much of the post-war planning, especially to do with the euro. And then in the 1990s, uh, or the late 1980s, Jacques Delors, who was the president of the European Commission, he set up the Delors Committee to set up to work out European Monetary Union, i.e. the euro, and where was it based? I mean, the politicians wanted it based in Brussels or Strasbourg, but no, it was based in Basel, physically, in the BIS, which served as its secretariat. So you can see again and again the bank is making itself absolutely the center point and re-evolving and reinventing itself. It's a very extremely clever and nimble institution. And one of the key people on the Delors Commission was Alexandre Lanfalushi, a Hungarian-born economist who's known as the father of the euro. What was his day job? He was general manager of the BIS. And after the Delors Committee passed its, uh, you know, was agreed and the plan was going forward for the introduction of the euro, they set up something called the European Monetary Institute, which was based, of course, at the BIS, and its boss was Alexandre Lanfalushi. And then it stayed there, I think, until the end of 1994, when it moved to Frankfurt and became the European Central Bank, which is another international bank protected by international treaty, which is also not very transparent and very influential. So you can see through the decades, you know, reparations, German reparations are finished in 1932. The BIS has no reason to exist, but it reinvents itself as the center for the first bailouts. Thoroughly tainted in the Second World War, most people thought it should have been closed down. Hey, actually, you can't close us down. You need us for the post-war global economy. Then the euro, and nowadays, the BIS is important for two things. Uh, every two months, just as has been the case all through the decades, all the central bankers, the key central bankers of the world meet there to discuss monetary policy. It's been absolutely crucial during the financial crisis. Now, I interviewed Mervyn King, who gave me a very good interview for my book, and he said that's the place where we meet and we discuss you know, policy options and we talk about what can be done and what can't be done. And the BIS is hosting, again, uh, it hosts the, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, which is absolutely crucial for commercial banks, not for, not for central banks, where they have the 8% rule, that you have to have 8% of assets compared to what you're lending. That's based at the BIS, serviced by the, at the BIS. Several other committees are based at the BIS, more obscure committees like the Markets Committee and the F Financial Stability Board as well, which is going to be very, very important. It's the new... Uh, people say it's the fourth pillar of the global financial system really after the IMF and the commercial banks and the BIS because it's coordinating national central banks and monetary authorities and the regulators. So they want good things there. They don't, you know, they, they, they don't want bad things for us. They want a stable global economy. They want central banks that don't go bust. They want currencies that are stable. But uh, it's all rather opaque and I think it should be opened up somewhat. Great. Thank you. It's a great, uh, a great kickoff. Um, there are actually a, a, a couple things that really struck me in the book. And it's okay. Um, if anybody else has uh, phones, if you can make sure they're on, on vibrate. Um, but uh, what, what really struck me is um, you, you talked a little bit in the book about uh, how everybody said that nobody saw. 2007 and 2008 coming. And uh, the Bank for International Settle Settlements certainly did. I've seen some of the, the very prescient reports that they came out, really some of them you know, quite damning of uh, what was going on in the, situa in the, in the financial uh, markets. Um, but at the same time, they, they all saw what was coming and, and didn't do anything. You talk a little bit about political pressures. Um, but I, I'd love to see you expand a little bit more on that. What, you know, what could uh, they have done if they had wanted to, and, uh, and why didn't people listen? Well, yes, it's true. The BIS, ever since it was set up, has had an extremely good research department, 
and it reaches back to Pear Jacobson's days. Uh, they, every year they bring out an annual report, which uh, they started out at sort of 40 or 50 pages, and now they run to a couple of hundred, and they're just full of information about the global f economy and global finance and a lot of really technical stuff about the markets. And, and these reports are compiled by you know, extremely competent and very professional people. And in the early, well, sort of the mid-2000s, the BIS was one of the first organisations to spot that, hey, there's too much money sloshing around here and it's not being properly controlled and it's not being, uh, you know, properly regulated and we're warning you that, uh, you know, this, this could all end badly. I mean, they didn't say it definitely will, but they, they were one of the first warners. I mean, and that's one of the interesting things about them perhaps because you know, being in Switzerland all this time, their, their banking culture, because their, of their own banking operations, is very conservative and very careful. You know, and, it, and they don't need to take risks because they're the bank for central banks and, and you know, they have a, like a triple diamond starred credit rating. So you know, anything that you, you put in there is going gonna, is gonna to make money, basically. So they're very cautious and they've always been arguing against inflation and against you know, too much money in the money supply. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they issued these warnings, and uh, you know, the central banks didn't didn't listen to them. Perhaps if they had done, things might have worked out differently. But I mean, the, also you can say you know the causes of the global financial crisis are many and and, and complex. But they did they did certainly uh, they were they were warning about uh, you know there's too much money sloshing around in the American monetary you know money mark in the American mortgage market. The whole uh, Freddie Mac. Uh, Affair. They were, you know, they were on the case on that. They know what's going on. Um, the other thing that that struck me was, you know, you're very, very critical of the the secrecy, uh, the bank, the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability, and um, could you talk a little bit more what 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 you think the, the implications are of that today? Yes. I what, mean, the, what, what are the costs that we're paying for that? Yeah, the bank was set up in 1930, and I talked a little bit. Uh, in the beginning about how you know it was so secretive and and you know that journalists that the reporter from the New York Times couldn't even look in the room where the directors had met well I mean a lot of that still carries on now when the bank the central bankers meet there every two months for these for the Basel weekends you know they fly in on a Saturday or Sunday and stay till the Tuesday usually but no journalists are allowed in the building at that time and um, my uh, uh, criticism of the bank secrecy is that we don't know who attends these meetings, and we don't know what's discussed, and, and we don't know what kind of themes are being raised. And these are public servants. Central bankers are public servants. We're paying for their salaries. We're paying for their plane fares. You know, we have we 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 should be told. You know, what are the general themes of discussion? Who was there, and what is the kind of feeling of you know what's the mood music at the moment, and. The bank says, oh, or central bankers say, oh, you know, we need a place to speak in, in secret, and if you put everything on the record, then no one will say anything, and you don't want to put a camera in and put it on YouTube, and then, you know, no one will say a word. And I say, look, you know, because what are central bankers like if you say you need to change this? They sort of give you the ridiculous scenario, you know, and I'm not saying you have to put a camera in there and put it on YouTube. Obviously, central bankers... You know, need to be able to talk in private. That's fair enough. But they could release. They could have a press conference after these meetings. They could release the minutes. You know, not detailed minutes of who said what, but you know, the feeling of the meeting was that, you know, that this or that. That they could uh, tell us who was there. You know, they could make a step towards transparency. And I think that would be very. And I think that's something that's very important because. The whole feel among most people, the feeling of global international finance, how it's run, is it's still run by these, you know, guys in suits. They're nearly almost all men at these meetings that jet in and tell countries you've got to do this, you've got to do that, and you know, well, where's your mandate? You know, and if you look now, you know, even the IMF is telling George Osborne in Britain that's too much austerity, actually, George, and they're saying, well, actually, maybe we got it slightly wrong in Greece that if you cut a country to the bone, you know, it's not going to recover because everyone's going to have no money to reinvigorate the economy. So, okay, the BIS isn't it isn't issuing, you know, demands like that, but it's still part of the inf you know of a of the structure of global finance, and I think it it should change.
and the culture should change. And the interesting thing about the Federal Reserve uh, is that, you know, for example, every two weeks the, the Open Markets Committee releases the minutes of the previous meetings. Now, if you type in to Google Federal Reserve uh, Basel BIS meeting, It'll, it'll direct you to the Federal Reserve website where it will tell you which official of the Federal Reserve is at the BIS for those meetings, where, what meetings they're attending, where they are hour by hour. It tells you everything apart from what hotel they're in and what room they're in for the reasons of their own security. And, you know, hey, guess what? The Federal Reserve hasn't collapsed yet and neither has the BIS. So, I mean, there's definitely room for improving transparency. Do you think a way of, of, of making more of that happen could, could be... You know, from the other countries, Do there, are there any other countries that, that are that as transparent as the Fed is? And could individual efforts by, by everybody to replicate what the, the, the U.S. Fed is doing, could that, could that break it loose? Well, it could do. I mean, the Bank of England, uh, you know, releases uh, some information as well. But Mervyn King was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty solid that, you know, we don't really want to release any information about these meetings. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a juggling act. I mean, people, powerful people who are meeting in secret are not going to say, oh, all right, then I'll tell you everything that we talked about, you know. But if pressure is being put on them, and the, and the pressure is happening, and it's a kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's a very inchoate pressure, but there's a shift in perceptions about institutions around the world, you know, to do, look at social media and what's happened in the Arab Spring and, and the Occupy movement. People are demanding accountability nowadays, and I feel that BIS needs to adapt to that. Well, I do want to open the discussion to, to the whole room. Um, just a uh, just ho housekeeping reminder, um, if you could wait for the, for the microphone to come to you before you start speaking. Um, and uh, normally we ask everyone to say who they are, but I understand the cameras are here. Not everybody wants to say that. So if you don't want to say who you are, um, you can say, you know, I'm Roger Rabbit. <laughs> and, um, and the other thing is, I just I want to mention this, uh, not all of our salons are on the record, but this one tonight is. And uh, please feel free if you'd like to tweet um, using uh, at World Policy and uh, hashtag political salon. Um, so do we have a, a question? Hi, I'm Bill Armbruster. A couple of questions. First of all, roughly how many central bankers attend these meetings uh, every two months? Also, how large is the staff of the BIS and where do they come from? Yeah, good, good questions. Give us a sense of the place. Well, about 60 is the answer. 60 fly in to Zurich on the Saturday or the Sunday and they're met by a fleet of limousines which sweep them off to Basel. It's about an hour's drive away. But what's interesting at the BIS, which again is perhaps a reflection of its Swiss heritage, is how very hierarchical the weekend meetings are. You know, they start on the Sunday night with the most important meeting is called the Economic Consultative Committee, and that's composed of the BIS Board of Directors, which is basically the governors of the Federal Reserve Bank of England, Bank of France, European Central Bank, so on, and uh, India and Brazil, and the BIS General Manager. And that's the elite meeting where I think a lot of the discussions have gone on about coordinating the response to the global financial crisis. And that's the, there's 18 of them at that in the fine dining room on the 18th floor. It's, it's a fabulous dining room. It has views over France and Switzerland and Germany. It's very global as befits a global institution. And then the next day there's the global economy meeting. And that's 30 countries. And then you have countries like Turkey and the Philippines and Indonesia uh, will attend that, as well as the 15 or 18 that were there the previous night. And they sit around a table. And another 15 countries are allowed to attend the meeting but are not really supposed to speak unless it's really, really urgent. You know, countries like uh, Hungary, for example, or, or uh, Macedonia, they're, you know, they're, they're allowed to attend but they don't talk. And then, oh no, actually, sorry, I think Macedonia is not allowed to attend because then there's another 15, the final 15, the third division, they're not even allowed to attend the global economy meeting, they just kind of have to hang around. And then, but they are allowed to attend a lunch, they all have a fantastic buffet lunch. So it's very hierarchical, and people have told me that in the meetings, who counts is the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the Bundesbank, and the European Central Bank. That's basically what counts. 
of course, everyone is very polite, you know, to each other, and and nobody, you know, the the Swiss, the managers of the BI, has been working on this hospitality for you know, more than 70 years, so it's very pleasant, it's very comfortable. All the governors get a gov uh, get their own office, a dedicated office, which they just use for two or three days, those two or three days um, uh, every couple of months, and all the secretarial st uh, secretariat staff that they want. And to answer your second question, it's really a great place to work because. Uh, Firstly, especially if you're at a senior level, you're, you've got sort of, I mean, not diplomatic status, but you've got, you know, you're kind of, you've got a sort of privileged status. And um, you get paid a lot, and it's tax-free. So the general manager, I think, I mean, perhaps, you know, compared to JP Morgan, it's not that much, but it's, it's the general manager, I think, last year got 850,000 euros tax-free, which is what's that, like $1.2 million or something, plus loads of allowances. And there's about 600 people working there from 50 countries, and people like working there. Because it's, it, there is also, it's rather like the UN, there's a bit of a sense of public mission. No, the BIS does do some good work. It provides services for small central banks that don't have the expertise. To, uh, Gives them, uh, does foreign exchange deals and gold swaps for them. It provides mat uh, asset management advice, you know, for smaller banks from small countries that simply don't have the expertise to do that. So there is a sense of the people who work there that they you know, this it's a global international institution. It's got a it's got a public mission, and uh, they you know they don't their salaries are tax free. It's a comfortable place to work. I spent a week there in the archives. It was very interesting. Um, because while you're in the archives, and the archives are open to any le legitimate researcher under the 30-year rule, almost all the files are open. But so apart from personal personnel files and that kind of stuff, but I spent a week there, and you would I would go in at 9:30, put my requests in, and the files would come up like half an hour later. But I had to stay in the archive room. I was allowed out to go to the uh, washroom or to get a cup of coffee, but I was strictly not allowed to go wander around the floor or go up on any other floor or explore on my own. When I wanted to go to the library, I was escorted to the library. I was escorted back. It's very high security there. It's not. It's unlike the UN in that, as far as I know, there's no tours. You can't, you know, you can't just have a tour. And I think that's a small thing, and that's a kind of a problem because, you know, really, there there should be. So that it should be open. People should be able to go and see what they're doing. It's also a very interesting building. It's kind of, it was built in 1977, and it's a tower block, and it's circular. So it's got these long, looping corridors, a lot of brown walls and beige furniture, and a lot of 1970s globular furniture. It's really, it's really <laughs> retro, and it's got this definite kind of, it's got tinted windows and this kind of James Bond, it's definite kind of James Bondy feel to it. It's a very, very interesting place. Good. So, Mike's coming. Hello, my name is Iksa and I'm a friend of World Policy Institute. My question is, what interested you in this? Tell us about your worldview and why you're on a crusade for transparency <laughs> for the Bank of International Settlements. Yeah. Well, it started um, with an earlier book I wrote called Hitler's Secret Bankers, which, which you kindly mentioned, but actually that was an investigative book. You know, although parts of it hopefully read a bit like a novel, you know, <laughs> and it was so gripping, but that was an investigative book. And I did a chapter in there. It was a book investigating Swiss banks and Nazi gold. Uh, and if you remember the late 1990s, the big scandal broke about Switzerland and all the, and all the uh, Holocaust assets and the dirty money that was sloshing around from the Second World War. And since I, it was one of several books that came out about that. And I, and I did a, a chapter on the BIS. And I just thought it was the strangest place. You know, I went there in 98 to interview the general manager. And they took a decision sensibly, that actually, that we're going to be open about what we did in the war. And um, I just thought, what is this place? This strange tower block by Basel railway station you know, overlooking like a, a big road next to it, almost like a mini motorway. And I just thought this is very, very interesting. And especially when I started to find out about Thomas McKittrick and, you know, the idea that during the war, while people were fighting for their lives just a few miles away in nice, safe Basel, with the knowledge of everyone in Berlin and London and Washington, 
this, you know, the channels are being kept open. I thought that was fascinating. And I became, I'm quite interested in institutions. I've written a book about the United Nations called Complicity with Evil, uh, which examines the UN's failures to stop genocide. And the title, by the way, is actually from a UN peacekeeping report. You know, it's the UN's own phrase that we have been guilty of complicity with evil. And I, I'm just interested in these international institutions, you know, the idea that you step through the door and you're not in, a, you're not in the country anymore, you're somewhere else. So it's just fascinating. Bill Armbruster again. You, you then mentioned China as a, a member. Are, are they actually? Him? Yes, China's, China's a member, and uh, China's an important member. The governor of the Bank of China attends the Economic Consultative Committee. In, uh, again, in, 19, in, the, in the 1990s, after um, the euro was invented, because the BIS was invented, set up as a very European institution, its first board of directors, you know, and and still includes nowadays the board of the government of the Bank of Belgium and Holland, which, with all respect to those countries, are not really you know, the key players anymore. But they're all still on the board and obviously not going to give those seats up. So after the euro had been invented and the European Central Bank had been set up, the BIS was thinking, you know, OK, well, what are we for? What are we going to do? And, and they realised that they had to become global. You know, they have to become a global institution. It was absurd that in the 1990s, you know, China wasn't a member, Brazil wasn't a member, Russia wasn't a member. So they let them all in quite, quite rapidly. And that's one of the interesting things about the bank is that it just reinvents itself continually. And, and I'm sorry, two other questions. First of all, uh, how much access did you have in terms of interviews? Also, if you could talk a little bit uh, about the bank's uh, role in setting the capital requirements for commercial banks. Sure. Um, well, th my reception was, was, was mixed, I would say. In the beginning, the bank was very helpful. I think they assumed that I was a kind of finance, you know, com banking specialist that was interested in uh, you know, very technical questions. And then... After a while, it became clear that I was interested in other things like governance and transparency and the history. So uh, on the history side, they were extremely helpful. The archivist, was uh, Edward Atkinson, was great. He got me all the documents I wanted. The bank's official uh, historian, head of information, Pete Clements, was extremely helpful to me and answered all my emails. But when I wanted more material about the present day, then uh, there was a lot of toing and froing, and uh, I, I had some access. I had an, an interview, an email interview, with Stephen Sacchetti, who's the head of the research department. You know, one of the successors to Pear Jacobson, like 20, 25 years, 30 years down the road, and then, um, and then, it, and then they became quite helpful again. So I think it was a learning process for them. And they, they, so it, it, it was mixed. They did answer all the questions that I asked. Uh, I mean, they responded to them, let's say. Some of them, uh, questions I asked, they would say no comments or we're not answering that. But they were professional in that they responded to my inquiries. And your second question about the Basel Committee. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the roots of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision and the 8% rule go back to the 1970s, I think, when a couple of banks went bust. One, one was on Long Island, Franklin Bank, I think, and a German bank went bust. And there was just a realisation that, you know, if these banks, because the, the economy was much more globalised, when those banks went bust, it had a, a, a knock-on effect to other banks who were exposed to them. So there was a realisation that we have to change this. And so the Basel the Committee on Banking Supervision was set up, and of course, where would it meet? In Basel, naturally. Where else would it be? So they, you know, over the years they've set up the eight percent rule, and it's gone. We've gone through Basel one and two and three, and again, that shows you. The, I mean, I don't really go into the technicalities of the Basel agreements in the book because it's not really about that. But it just what is interesting about that. It shows you how this bank, you know, reinvents itself, makes itself essential again and again and again. Because, I mean, hey, the Basel Committee has got to be based somewhere, so you know, it's kind of unthinkable that it would be anywhere else. In terms of the, the present and the, and the future, uh, obviously there's, there are transparency issues or accountability 
issues um, for a bank that, as you say, you know, the most famous bank nobody's ever heard of. Yeah. Um, if nobody's ever heard of it, how likely is it that we're going to see enough pressure to make these things change? And and I, I say that thinking about there was a story in the in the New York Times over the weekend about a sort of growing discontent with the the, the, the troika in um, yeah. in Europe and the, and the the policies of the the ECB and, and the the IMF, which you know interestingly has lately been the sort of you know pressing for austerity less than some of the other organizations. So is is that a sign that there is an increasing amount of pressure? And how likely is that pressure to get to the point where we're likely to see some real changes? Well, yes. I mean, I, th I think clearly there's just a general sense ac across the world, and especially in Europe, it's very strong in Europe, that uh, these people can't you know, just tell us what to do anymore. We need accountability. We need transparency. Now, the bank would say in its defence, and, it, and it's true that, uh, to some extent, that it has made moves towards transparency. I mean, it has a website. You can go on the website. You can download all the annual reports back to 1930 in two or three languages. You can see, you know, the list of staff that worked there, uh, you know, and, and the bank has a Twitter feed. It's, it, I mean, mostly tweets, you know, news about speeches by other central bankers. And they say they've, they've shifted towards that, but... I, I, my position is that you know there's much, 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 still much further to go, and I think that uh, it will adjust because if you know how do we know what's going to happen in the future is by looking at the past and throughout the decades, for 70 years this is a very smart institution that's just continually reinvented itself, often under pressure, but it has it knows how to adapt and how to move. You know it's when it like I said in the, when the European Central Bank left and it was no longer dealing with the euro, they realised, you know, we've got to bring in China and Brazil and India, you know, we have to do that. So I'm sure that will happen nowadays. And what I propose is that the bank issue a block of shares, uh, well, is that firstly the bank should set up a foundation. If this is really a, an institution with a mission of public service, as well as being enormously profitable. I mean, it made a, a billion dollars in profit last year, tax-free, which is not bad for a bank with 140 customers, <laughs> where you and I cannot have an account. Only people that work there can have an account, or other central banks and one or two international organisations. So I think you, I argue that it should set up a foundation, you know, perhaps roughly on the line of the George Soros' Open Society Institute, start training... Uh, bankers in the developing world start reaching out, being proactive, train young business people, use some of its profits for philanthropy. I mean, this is where they were not particularly helpful. I mean, I asked them, you know, if you do, a, I did a keyword search on the 2012 annual report, philanthropy, no results, charity, no results. Uh, and I asked them, you know, how much do you give away? And they wouldn't tell me. And I said, where do you give it? And they said, well, we support local you know, initiatives in Basel. I mean, it's not really good enough, is it? So, although they say that they do do a lot of training for central bankers, I mean, 5,000 central bankers a year go to the BIS for their seminars and meetings and lectures. But I, I feel that there's just, you know, the, zeit, the whole zeitgeist is changing about the accountability of finance, and they, and they will make that, you know, they will make that change. I mean, even when I was dealing with them, they changed. No, they were helpful at first and they realized what I was interested in they were not very helpful and then they became quite helpful again so they, you know these are very clever people they know what's going on and they they you know they have great antenna you know they're in that in that tower block on three borders they can feel where the way the wind is blowing and if it's blowing towards you know transparency they'll they'll adjust towards that what happens to the profits? Are they reinvested in the bank or do they go back to the, to the shareholders? They pay out the dividend every year to the shareholders and then they reinvest some in the bank. Yeah. In, the, in, the, in the, the plane tickets and the yeah. empty offices that are used mm -hmm. uh, a, few yeah. days, uh, <laughs> a few days out of the, the month yeah. or year. I mean, it's a very successful, it's a very successful bank. It's, very, it's very, very well run. Okay, do we have another question? Anyone else? Yeah. Who are the shareholders? The central banks. Oh, sorry, we missed the mic. The commercial. Do you, want to, do you want to do that again with the mic? Who are the shareholders? And, and the shareholders are the, are the member banks, the, the other central banks. Yeah. And there's an annual general meeting every year where they discuss you know, the, the, the way the bank is going and the governance of the bank. But another, another thing which we should mention is also is that 
the bank is still very Eurocentric. You can still see its heritage that it was set up in the 1930s, essentially by the Europeans and by America as well. I mean, after the collapse of communism, all the small countries like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Macedonia, Slovakia, oh, and the new countries, that they're all admitted. And I, I added up the population. It was something like 16 million people in all of these small new countries. But uh, in Africa, only Algeria and South Africa are members. Nigeria is not a member of of the BIS. You know, that's that's quite amazing that, you know, one of the biggest economies of the world is not a member. Pakistan is not a member. Kazakhstan are not members. So, you know, in Africa, uh, in so in Asia, in Central Asia, there's big gaps there. And I asked why, and they said, well, you know, the central bank has to meet certain standards of, of governance, but, you know, an economic transparency in the way the economy's run. But, you know, I mean, there's questions about economic governance in Russia and China and, and other places. So this, it's, it, it's changing, but slowly. <laughs> Are we seeing a similar dynamic to the IMF, where, where some of the, the countries that are not the usual suspects are being much more vocal, you know, particularly people, you know, the, from, the, from the big BRIC countries? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, what I've, what I've heard is um, that in the global economy meetings recently, there's been a, quite a lot of anger uh, about, the, about quantitative easing and all the money that's sloshing around in very low interest rates, because what that's causing is a kind of capital of mobility and capital flight to other countries for, like in Asia, like Korea and Malaysia they're very upset because all this money's pouring in to get higher interest rates and they don't want it because it's distorting their economies so some of the global economy meetings have, have been quite uh, I mean everything's very polite but the sort of very barbed discussions going on there and the governor of the Central Bank of Australia actually gave a speech saying all of this, and this is what had been being said behind the scenes. So, yeah, there's definitely a, a shift, you know, that the, in the, the developing world um, and away from Europe and the West, uh, people, are, those countries, are definitely finding their voices. They're much more confident. And also, you know, the economies, some of them are doing quite well, and they look at Europe and Greece and think, God, what a... Disaster, and you're, you know, you Europeans are telling us what to do. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a bit of an, an echo of, of 2007, 2008, where you're getting warnings of something going on that's going to cause problems. And I, I'm having this moment of déjà vu to the to the early 90s, where of course you had uh, you had very low interest rates, all the money poured into mm -hmm. what then were beginning to be called emerging markets, yeah. and then it. It flew back out, and yeah. you you get the tequila crisis, you get all those yeah, Asian yeah. crises, and it's it's not like it didn't didn't happen before. Mm. So it seems like with two thousand seven, two thousand eight, here's a very big problem that is looming yes. that they're discussing, yeah. but they're not doing anything about it. No, because ultimately, however globalized finance is, these are governors of national central banks, and their interest, you know, they're accountable to the Senate or to the British government or the French government, and their interest is their national economy. So, you know, there was quite a lot of anger, I understand, among other Asian countries about Japan, but, you know, the countries are countries. So that's kind of the price we pay for living in a world of nation states. It seems like there's a, a balancing between short-term and long-term long thinking because, you know, for example, it wasn't really in the United States' interest that Mexico had a tequila crisis. No, not at all. Not at all. No. And uh, there's, there's a real feedback loop when, uh, when there's a problem caused by one country, yeah. goes to the other country and then it feeds back to the, to the first country, but it doesn't, uh, there doesn't seem to be an awareness mm -hmm. that it's time to, to do something. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's, yeah, because it's the way that the system's set up is that the deci national decisions have, you know, very fast global ramifications and consequences, which aren't really the concern that much of people because they're taking the decisions on a national basis. But I, th I mean, uh, that I think that that is not an argument for supranational government. I think it's just an argument that that's part of the rough and tumble of the global economy and national economies. Mm -hmm. And certainly some of the bankers that, that you write about, you quote saying, hey, we, we, need, we need more of a global government rather than, than less. Christopher? Uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, so Christopher Shea, Managing Editor of World Policy Journal, 
Um, I'm curious, you've talked a lot about what the BIS ought to do. I'm curious about what you think will happen and how um, the BIS will invent itself in the future. I think uh, that you'll see um, some moves. Well, I mean, it partly depends on what uh, the pressures are on it. I mean, institutions respond to pressures. So if this general sense that the Troika you know, has no mandate and shouldn't be telling people what to do and that the, the technocrats are getting it wrong, become stronger and stronger, the BIS will move towards a greater transparency. I mean, my idea for a, in a foundation and a block of shares being given to civil society, I think, is, is a bit of a dream, a bit of a pipe dream. But, I mean, I think that's what they should do, but I don't see that happening in the near future. But I could imagine that some you know down the line they release more information about the global economy meetings that they that they become more of an outward looking organization and feel that they need to be a bit more accountable it kind of depends on on the, on the pressures upon them but there's definitely you know i live in europe but i know that in europe there's a real sense of anger about this idea you know against the troika which the bis is not part of the troika but the ecb which is the european central bank is an important part of the bis so they're kind of connected to it and the bis has always argued against inflation and been in favor of you know more in favor of austerity and careful prudence and than playing with the money supply to try and you know boost growth so they're part of that continuum good do we have any other questions well, I know we have a number of, um, of books who are, that are uh, available here, the Tower of Basel. Um, I'm sure that um, Anna would be happy. Very to, happy. Uh, to I'm never happier than when I'm signing books. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here to volunteer him for, for you know, carpal tunnel syndrome. Thank you, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I wanted to thank you again for all for, for coming out on such a, a dismal, drizzly, rainy, rainy night. And particular thanks to Adam. We're very, very happy to, uh, to have him here. His reputation preceded him. And I'm never happier than I'm when I'm talking about a, a geeky finance mm -hmm. topic with, with someone who is, is just as passionate about the intricacies of, of global banking. So, um, so thank you again, uh, Adam. And, and thanks to, uh, to all of you. Thank you very much for listening. And he said, after the director's meeting, he wasn't even allowed into the room when they'd all gone because the space was so protected and so sacred. So I think that's very interesting because what it tells us is if you've ever wondered how we got to this place where all these people from the IMF and the ECB and the World Bank and whatever are flying around the world, if you look at Greece, for example, I mean, how did, how did we get here that these kind of unelected technocrats are telling everyone and telling elected governments what to do. I th my argument is that all this started at the BIS, which was the first place, you know, the birthplace of the global financial technocrat. And in the 1930s, it did some uh, good things. It organized some of the first bailouts for Spain and Hungary and Austria. But again, what was interesting was that these bailouts were being organized by the BIS and the central bankers who were meeting there. They were, I don't quite know how governments could do that, but there was no kind of political input. It was the bankers deciding where's the money going, how much they're going to get it. And, it's, and so you see the continuity of that uh, nowadays. And the BIS, the two people who really worked to set up the BIS were a guy called, a man called Montague Norman, who was the governor of the Bank of England, 1920 to 1944, and Jarmar Schacht, who was the president of the Reichsbank. And they were very close friends. And was so that central bankers, i.e. the governors of national banks like the Bank of France, the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve and so on, could have a place to meet that was supremely protected and legally inviolable. What does that mean? That means that the BIS is an international organisation, but it's also a commercial bank. It's a, a unique hybrid in the world. It's the world's oldest global financial institution. It was set up before the IMF and before the World Bank. But it's got, uh, as a commercial bank, it's got a, like a mission and a duty to make a profit, but it's got all of the same protections, or uh, almost all as the United Nations or the International Monetary Fund. So from the moment it was set up uh, by an international treaty, the BIS's premises is almost extraterritorial. 
The Swiss authorities have no jurisdiction over it. Same as you know, the American embassy or the British embassy anywhere does, uh, has that level of protection. And during the 1930s, the BIS became a place where the central bankers could meet and discuss things away from politicians and away from the eyes of reporters. And in fact, during the 30s, the bank was so secretive that there was a New York Times reporter who went out to Basel to do a big piece on the BIS, a big takeout for the magazine, as it was then. And he, and he got into the building coming tonight and also for C-SPAN coming along to film us. Much, much appreciated. So we, I'm going to start a bit by just talking in general, taking you through a bit of the history of the Bank for International Settlements, and then you can kind of understand where it came from, why it's set up, and what it does today. So what is the Bank for International Settlements? Well, I always say it's the most important bank in the world that you've probably never heard of. Most people have never heard of the BIS, apart from people who are dealing with uh, you know, the more technical side of central banking or international finance. So the BIS was set up in 1930, and it was set up as part of the Young Plan. Its uh, history reaches back to the end of the First World War, and after the Germans lost, they were punished by being forced to pay reparations. And there was a lot of arguments about these reparations. How much would they pay? How long would they go on for? And... Um, what happened was uh, the Allied powers agreed that through the Young Plan, the BIS would be set up to collect and minister, uh, administer and manage these reparations payments. So it was set up for a really kind of obscure basis. You know, it, it, this was not a big uh, geopolitical question at the time of German reparations for the thir First World War. But the real reason it was set up Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I know a lot of people here, but for the new faces, I'm Michelle Wooker. I'm president of the World Policy Institute. We are a global center for thought leadership focused on emerging challenges, emerging thinkers, and emerging solutions, which awfully exactly that order. Uh, we publish World Policy Journal, and we like to bring people together in open settings. Uh, we believe the policy is, is not just for wonks, and the, the Political Salon series is, we think, really the, the heart of that philosophy. Uh, the series was, was started almost 10 years ago by a close friend of the Institute, Steve Sokol, uh, who is now in Pittsburgh at the World Affairs Council, uh, bringing together a diverse group of people across political affiliations, across careers, across nationalities, to come together around the table and talk about global issues in, in a way that's really relevant to everyone. So we're delighted to continue that series. Uh, and we are especially delighted uh, to have with us tonight um, Adam Labor, um, who is not only a journalist uh, for, the, for The Economist and uh, The Times of London, Monocle, and other places, but he is also an accomplished novelist. And um, I'm guessing it's probably not coincidence that one of his novels is called Hitler's Secret Bankers, uh, which has a little bit to do uh, with the book that we are uh, here to talk about today, um, Tower of Basel, which is just a fantastic title. I love that. Um, so he's, uh, he's really delved into this, this bank, which is something that, uh, that a lot of people haven't heard of, uh, but that plays a pivotal, pivotal role in what's happening in the global economy and will continue to going forward. So he's going to talk a little bit about the, the history of the, the bank, uh, the more recent history, and he's got some very interesting uh, suggestions going forward for how the bank could be more transparent and accountable and hopefully lead to, uh, to better government. Um, the format of these talks is, uh, is informal. Uh, Adam will speak a little bit at the beginning, and then I will I'll kick off with a couple of questions, and then we open it up to the room. That the, really, what makes this event great is all of you. So, uh, be ready to uh, to tee up uh, your question. Uh, we're delighted that uh, C-SPAN Book TV is here with us tonight. Uh, so, if you could do us a favor, if you do have a, a question, just wait for the for the mic to come around so that um, so that we can hear you. But um, with that said, um, Adam, welcome. We are very very happy to have you here, and I'm particularly looking forward to what you have to say because I'm I'm a big you finance geek. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to say uh, thanks to Michelle and to the World Policy Institute for having me here and for all of you.